but we're recording now. So, uh, welcome to uh, to those of you tuning in. Um, I want to introduce, uh, as you guys know, my name is Steve Lewis. This is her panel forums. I have my guest today, uh, Liam Sinclair from Reptiles and Research. You might have seen him on YouTube um, and a fixture at the Advancing Herpetological Husbandry pages as well. Um, so, Liam, I uh, wanted to uh, say hello. Thanks for joining me today. Why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us, uh, you know, a little bit about yourself. How you got started with reptiles and with your YouTube. <laughs> That's a loaded question. Well, thanks for having me, first <laughs> yeah. of all. Um, well, with reptiles, I got into it after being into inverts. Um, originally, I wanted to go for a zoo career. Um, I really didn't like how strict some things could be, because sometimes you'll know what something was better for animals' welfare. But if you want to make a, make like a substrate change, you have to go through like a appeal process and write loads of forms up just to make a bedding change or something. So when owning exotics appealed to me was that you're not just the keeper, you're, you're the curator of the collection, you're the right. you're everything in between. So you have complete control. So if you think something's better, you can just make that change and you have control. And it was that control that I wanted. But um, in terms of the YouTube channel, um, it, so a place for me, trying to not be negative, be positive. So I saw the issues with understanding certain things um, in terms of welfare and folklore husbandry. Um, and I just wanted to correct it. Um, but I also wanted this channel to be my place to, to learn myself. So I wanted it to be an avenue for me to direct my learning to and also document as well. So even let's let's say I had kids, they can come back and say, how did you start keeping? Well, so, well I've literally got it like from here down to like 2020 now. So it's a place for me to document my learning, but also to investigate husbandry. And also going forward now, I'm, I'm trying to offer it as a platform to get other people um, who may not be online, but have the experience to have a say. So I'm starting a new series where it's like learning from other keepers. So I'm getting some perhaps not online people involved that way. So mm. it's just learning, but in a more scientific way to keeping. Right on. Uh, that's kind of the mission of, of, of this channel too. Um, I, I, I used to teach little kids, um, educational program stuff, take with bearded dragons and uh, royal pythons and uh, boa constrictors and stuff. To, uh, to, we had a big tegu that was always a big hit. Uh, to little birthday parties and schools and stuff. And um, I just thought it would be nice. You know, I, I wish there was something like that for me. So instead of attending classes, I just started inviting people that knew more about me, uh, knew more about the uh, topics than I did and, and holding Zooms with them. So uh, welcome. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about just kind of exactly what got you into it. So to, today we're going to discuss basically the, the snake care sheets that are out there in the world. Um, and obviously different species are gonna have different specific needs. So instead of breaking down just one specific species of, of care sheets, we're gonna kind of generalize and go over some of the things that are common themes amongst all of the sheets. Um, things that you'll find online in a one to three page uh, document that's gonna tell you everything you need to know about keeping a snake happy for the rest of its life. Um, so uh, a lot of these examples come from a really popular magazine and it gets updated regularly. So this isn't something that is uh, 50 years old of husbandry knowledge per se, but it is, um, even if it is, it's, it's still uh, thought of as, as fresh and, and current. So uh, I do want to point out that if you follow these care sheets, uh, your snake will eat, shed, survive, and reproduce for you. And the reason why I invited you on, Liam, uh, is not simply just to refute the care sheets, but to go over essential items needed for a better care guide and, and to discuss, as you mentioned earlier, animal welfare. Uh, husbandry can be extremely intricate and you can spend many, many years learning how to perfect care for just one species. Um, most, but most of our care gets reduced to the lowest common denominator and then is applied to the whole of the species. Meaning like a rat keeper is gonna tell us that keeping in tubs works best for them. So that's how you should keep them as a pet. Um, what I love about your channel is that uh, you suggest elevated husbandry uh, that is really easy to achieve for all levels of keepers. So that's why I brought you on today. Um, and let's kind of jump right in. That was kind of my preamble. Uh, one word that is repeatedly used on your channel is welfare. And I just 
Today, read an article you posted on the Advancing Herpetological Husbandry Facebook page uh, defining what welfare is, and I'll try and link that in the video notes, um, but can you explain to me what that means? What is welfare? Isn't that what animal rights activists are always talking about? <laughs> yeah, um, it was kind of like, felt like 20 questions in one bit there. So. You're welcome. <laughs> um, I don't necessarily think I necessarily need to refute care guides. I think care guides can have their place. I just think people need to uh, not take a care guide and go, right, done here, or accept all of that as good information, and then that's it. Uh, everyone needs to take th that bit that works from there and that bit that works from over here, and this, that, this, that, and this, that, and then pull together their collective husbandry. Now, I, I don't think we're ever going to reach perfect husbandry because what, what was considered perfect 10 years ago is not what's going to be perfect like 20 years to come. So it's more about just progressing, I think, progressing past what has been done. And I, I don't think we need necessarily have to like slight anyone for how they used to do it, but I think failure to recognize progression um, and failure to recognize that it's not just a case of oh, we're, we're done here they've bred we can take this further mm -hmm. and I think that 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 is the future of the hobby um, um I've kind of forgotten the rest the rest of it already so no, that's <laughs> great so uh, that's fine because like I said, like you said there's about 20 questions rolled into one what is uh what is welfare why is this so this is a term that gets used a lot by you um and by a lot of other people too but I'm not sure everyone is using it the same way so um what is welfare how do you see it defined and how does it apply to uh, husbandry as opposed to animal rights activists well i was gonna say on a long route here isn't it that's fine <laughs> um, that's what we're here for well welfare originally started when people had issues with the way that livestock was being housed and kept so certain legislation was brought in so that you know this animal in this store could turn completely or it could lay down stand up it was very basic um in the very early stages it was about avoiding like negative things for the animal so it was always about not having diseases or you know free from pr predation and things like that um but it, it's kind of evolved as it is as a science now P people th use welfare as like um this subjective term as if it's like quality of life you can make an argument that oh i think this quality of life is good enough to me because that term is kind of subjective but with animal welfare it's a science it's, it's things that you can be as laurie always says something that you can literally get a degree in so it's it's not necessarily something of oh i don't agree with welfare so it doesn't exist to me no it exists just because you ignore science doesn't make it suddenly mm. not exist so it's, it, there, there's, a, there's a lot of different definitions throughout the history of it and i imagine laurie would know um a lot of them as well some of the ones that i was actually taught for my degree i actually see is a little bit outdated now but some of it was like how an animal copes with its um captive environment physically um um and psychologically um but there's there's some later ones from like you know san diego zoo that was like um is the animal welfare is the measurement of uh how an animal copes from psychologically emotionally and physically on measured on a continuum from good to poor and i think that um is probably the best definition I, i've i've agreed with so far and i think that is pretty spot on back in like 2011 there was this there was this um woman who wrote, wrote a paper she's called vicky melfi now she wrote this paper about the zoo world and the title was something this is one of the resources that i left in that article i wrote yeah but the title was something like um we aren't using evidence-based husbandry, um, something, something, something. And just, just to summarize, it was essentially, we, we're doing things 
because they've always been done rather than with like empirically um, tested and found this to be working best with science. So and was she exam- sorry? Was she talking about reptiles or in general, all over the okay. board for animal keeping? Okay. Um, and it, actually, in that paper, she actually um, highlighted the differences between taxa research. So mammals, you know, big cats was like up here. I just had a snake slam itself against the wall. And so mammals and big cats and everything, primates was up here. And then like it went like birds and then like reptiles was like right down here with amphibians and inverts. So we we don't even have the research we should have, which is why I think so much folklore husbandry has taken hold in, in private herpetoculture. And that's a, that's a load of term already but um, in this paper basically she said we've been so focused on the avoidance of negative um, on this continuum from good to poor that if we only focus on the avoidance of negative we can only get to the middle adequate because we've never even considered what positive welfare or going past that is and that kind of exploded things in the zoo world and got people ticking um, and it's kind of dribbled over into herpetoculture and stuff now, but current day, we're talking things like the, yes, the, the avoidance of negative is important, but we're also talking about trying to include indicators of positive welfare. And what I think the most important thing every keeper needs to wrap their head around is choice and control in the snake. Um, where do you want me to take it from there? Because I've got three points probably need to elaborate on. <laughs> no, I think that's great. I think so if I could sort of like visualize it, uh, th- that spectrum you're talking about, there's there's a middle point. And then maybe to this point is poor welfare. Um, yeah. And then to this point is uh, good welfare. Um, mm-hmm. And and sort of if, if so long as you don't, as long as you're eliminating the negative aspects, uh, you know, you're providing food from it, you're keeping it free from disease, um, it has water, you know, so it's, it doesn't have parasites. The best you can do is reach this middle point. So you've eliminated all that poor side over there, but you're not, there's this whole other end of the spectrum that you're trying to get. And so that's kind of our thoughts is that the uh, most care sheets are going to get you right around here. You might kind of creak over here, the more you experiment with them, but there's a whole lot more that we can discuss. So it's kind of, that's kind of what I wanted to see was how do we move on from the midpoint to the advanced and the and the, the, uh, the the good welfare, especially for someone as a beginner? Because I think the thing that's so great about a care sheet is they're one to three pages, and you mm-hmm. can read them. But you could read them if uh, if your dad takes you to the store to pick up your first snake. You could read it by the time you get home in the passenger seat, and you know set it up with your heat mat and stuff like that. So shouldn't it be just? I I think it's just as easy though to do it the right way. So what is a what is it that's taking welfare from that midpoint over here to the better part of that spectrum? Well, there's lots of is is a lot of things at once. So you could say like excellent body condition, uh, or good good muscle tone, and is it an indicator of positive welfare? But then if that animal has a complete lack of ability to express species typical behaviors then you can't exactly say that that has overall good welfare when that individual is failing in areas where the animal isn't failing the keeper and the care is failing in that aspect to get it all up there so it's cumulatively getting all aspects up this end so what one of the big things for uh, as positive indicators of welfare is being able to express species typical behaviors and obviously this is where catering the care down into individual species and sometimes even in your individual snake can can be that i mean let's say something like i don't know a water snake um one one of that species typical behaviors would be like bathing swimming those aquatic behaviors well if you're keeping that in an enclosure that doesn't have something that allows those behaviors to be expressed then you arguably aren't seeing those natural behaviors now that's going to be completely different from say something that like a kenyan sand boa 
whose natural behaviors isn't typically catered or didn't evolve around swimming. So things are going to be individualized to each species. But there's a thing where perhaps not every keeper even realizes the full capability of the species they're keeping or even don't even fully understand the natural history or the species typical behaviors of the animal. And that's where choice and control comes into things. You start thinking of how you provide your care as, oh, I'm not keeping it this temperature or I'm keeping it this humidity and focusing so much on trying to do all this rather than thinking about provide choices. And then most of it is taken out of your hands when you provide a multitude of choices and just let the animal select within that. And then you just find out what, natural behaviors actually can come out of it when you provide a large large enough complex environment where choices and these things can be expressed but you don't you're not going to get that unless we actually start thinking about taking things to the next level and trying to extract as many positive indicators of welfare as possible and, and so by choices uh you did a great job of, of outlining this in, in your article um you're referring to like being hot and dry versus hot and mm -hmm. humid, right? Um, so like in a, in a complex environment, is that what you're describing? Yeah, I think I, maybe I should provide, um, maybe you can edit this in. I'll provide you with the images. I actually made graphics of how I do this king snake set up behind me. But okay, so I've got my UVB. I've got my overhead lamps all on one side. So one third the enclosure and the other third cascades into darkness. Or, or less less light anyway. So that is a choice between UVB bright or and warm or cool dark. So that, that's a choice. That's a thermal gradient choice. Everyone's fully aware of how a thermal gradient is set up to allow the animal to choose between how it wants to thermoregulate. But right. there's also like like a, a light gradient to allow them to choose their exposure to radiation. There's also a humidity gradient. It could be really drier at the basking spot because obviously you're burning off all that vapor and stuff. But if you have microclimates at the back here on the cool side or here and there, you're then providing a humidity gradient. And that comes into things like natural soils. If you've got a deep enough layer where they can burrow and perhaps you've got a humid layer beneath that top dry layer, then suddenly everything becomes choice between different gradients it can be a gradient between loads of things like and my basking spot i've literally cluttered it in a way where it can either be exposed to radiation from the bulb and heat or it can be this cork bark slightly to the side with like a bit underneath so it's like darkness and heat from that residual rock being heated you can just plan things out better so that even the way you place cork bark is a choice it's not just like, oh, this looks cool to me because it looks natural. Like, you can strategic. There, oh, there we go. I wonder what's happened then. So, yeah, you can be strategic with it and think, actually, I'm putting this here for a reason because this is providing a choice. So, look, even this branch here in the middle, they can get to a higher UVI there or they can sit at the front and get to a lower UVI. The whole thing. And the most important thing to me is that this, if the snake can move across, there you go, if the snake can move across the whole thermal gradient without being seen, then the snake doesn't have to choose between what temperature it wants to be at and trying to maximize its security, especially if you have something that's really open. And I think this is the main thing that I think a lot of people might not necessarily realize that goes, oh, our snakes like these tight, small spaces. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. But when they try and put that snake in the bit of view and it's got like two highs on either side and this massive gap in the middle, then of course the, <laughs> your animal is going to experience some level of stress because you've just changed the entire environment at once and then it's like exposed on all, <laughs> on everywhere. So You're right. No, so that's that's great. And I think this is a, this is a perfect example of... Um... Uh, a word I learned from from you or a phrase, the habitat complexity, um, where there's there's a lot of tight small spaces. So instead of just making the cage a tight small space, um, you give them the choice to see which tight small space they want. Um, mm -hmm. Do they want uh, a, a small space that is 
Um, it's going to give them cool temperatures and, and away from the light, or do they want a, a small space that's going to really warm them up and give them that radiation that they're they're seeking out? Um, so I, I really liked that picture and in, in, in the the setup there for your snake. I think that's uh, it's really awesome, and and you'll really see if you were to study that snake for twenty four hours a day, I bet you'd see a lot of different activity in terms of where he oh, goes. Oh, it's, and... it's completely changed the individual snake. I can tell you that. Yeah, that's like, which which snake is this for? Mexican black king snake. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's, that's awesome. Uh, so, I've got that next there. to next to me. So when when I wake up, I'll see like that snake's in a completely different position. Yeah. <laughs> so you see those cork rounds where it's like a hole and it's hanging over the top. Sure. What I'm what I've seen is that he will uh, coil up, but then he'll let a coil like hang out loose mm -hmm. out from it under the UV. So he's chosen to be a higher uvi but also still hidden so it's not it's basically just all over the place it's some aspect or combination of things that he wants at any point any resource that he can access whether that be radiation or humidity or something is a choice yeah that's really cool that you're able to provide that and it kind of leads into one thing i want to talk about too so one of the first things that people are going to ask when they're when they're getting a new pet snake um is well what do i put it in right so so let's start with cage sizing a lot of care sheets, um, like we said, they prefer small, tight spaces um, for the most part. And, and they'll say for uh, as your snake grows, the general rule of thumb that I've seen in almost every care sheet across the board, um, at the largest they go, they'll say that the total length of the snake should equal the length plus the depth of the enclosure. Um, and, and so it, there's rarely a mention of height. Um, you, Sometimes it's, especially with uh, ball python tub keeping, they say, well, this is the size of the tub, um, and, you know, and it's, it's not a tree climbing species. So all it needs is, it, the snake is this tall, so it only needs that much room of, of tub. Um, what, what are your thoughts? Is there a minimum cage size that is best when you're bringing home a new pet snake? Um, so this is something I've been thinking about a lot recently. So in the UK, and in England especially, we have the Animals Activity Licence. So that is a piece of legislation for uh, reptile shops and pet shops where things have to be kept in a certain size as a minimum. So the rules are two thirds of the snake's body length in length of viv, and then one third of the snake's body length um, depth. Now, if you think about that, that, that really isn't big, is it? And people were up in arms when that came in, thinking, oh, it's going to ruin the hobby, this and that. It came in, people adapted, things moved on, and literally has not affected anyone. Shops are still making money, things are moving on. But th that equates to me putting a four-foot Mexican black king snake in a three-foot. And when I think about that, that, it's not really extreme, is it? Now, I think that is on the bare bones minimum. Um I've got mine in four foot, so I've got them exactly as long as the snake is. Now, that has always been much just my personal how I wanted to do things. But if we think about how the hobby isn't even like meeting these AAL standards, which frankly <laughs> aren't exactly that hard, that that would mean like a hatchling. Let's say you got like a twelve inch hatchling snake. That would mean putting that in theory in like a 10, 10 centimeter by like 20 centimeter top. I'm, I'm like, if you can't provide that, what? <laughs> but um, I would say that is bare bones really. And there's, there's studies that are literally came out this year where uh, I'll uh, see what Laurie said in a minute. Um, there are, there's a study that came out this year where these authors took um, a group of corn snakes and they gave them access between a like a smaller viv than they are with the exact same resources as a larger viv than they are and they had this like t-junction um piping between the two and they mm -hmm. would put allow the, the snake to go in this this t-junction and then it would select what it wants now they wouldn't start taking data until that snake had gone in both vivariums so that meant that they could they, that you couldn't say like oh it just went in the first one that I found. They wait until it had like checked both out before it started like taking the data. And what they found is that when the snakes want to be active and stuff, they will select for the larger enclosure because they've got more space. 
even though nothing about that environment is different. It wasn't the complexity. It was exactly the same complex wise, just size. So they selected for the size, but when they're resting, they're indifferent. So it wasn't a case of, so I, I posted this in a group a while ago talking about it and someone came up with this skewed interpretation of it. Oh, of course they're gonna be active until they find a nice hiding spot. No, no they, were, they chose the larger space when they were active, but when they want looking for a hiding spot, doesn't matter the size. So in this paper, the authors then recommended that the length of a vivarium should be the length of snake as a minimum or larger because they will select for that. And you, you really can't argue with that, really. I mean, yeah, if you're keeping like a retic and someone's saying to you that now keep it in like an 18 foot viv, well, yeah, you might want to argue that. But at the same day, should you have, if you can't provide that sort of setup, should you have got a retic in the first place, really? Like, why get a zoo animal if you can't provide a zoo setup? No, but, I, I agree with that completely. Um, the, there's some animals that uh, it's just too big. Um, mm -hmm. the, the standard retic cage in the hobby is uh, eight foot by three foot by two foot. Um, and that doesn't even work out to that AAL standard. It's not, not even, even two close. Third. No, that's <laughs> how. And this, this will move into animal rights when I talk about that later on, how yeah. it really annoys me how blind the hobby is. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that is a, a minimum. And then you go into like, like veterinary textbooks, like the matters, reptile, um, reptile medicine. And th their recommended standards is, um, it was different. It was uh, different for arboreal. And they had an entire section just for whip snakes and coach whips. Um, but a terrestrial snake, they had like, it was something like minimum. They had like a breeder's minimum and like a pet minimum. Mm -hmm. And I think it was like, one meter squared per meter of snake body length for the breeders and and it was something or other um larger than that for a pet keeper and i worked it out that would, that would mean keeping my th my three foot male mbk in a six by two by two and that was their their minimum recommendations so suddenly when you think oh an enclosure the length of the snake that, that's not really that extreme anymore is it when you realize what the veterinary textbooks are recommending right so uh, personally I, I i would say the, the length of the snake yeah um i think that's a, a great starting point and i think i i have got six snakes and, and, and right now um most of them are, are fairly small with the exception of a couple of brazilian rainbow boas behind me and when i was planning on getting the four by two by twos last year uh i was like oh that's that's a great size you know that's big it's bigger than a lot of people get it's got some climbing height and stuff and the more i learn about how they move and, and where they go it's like oh god i wish i wish i got bigger um and and i will uh it's just that uh, it's a matter of finding the space and finding the funds for it and, and getting up to it um but i think if you know that before uh, before you bring home your first snake um I think that's valuable information. It's like, look, this, you're getting a four foot snake, you know, this king snake is going to grow to be four feet. Don't just assume it's going to stay in the 20 gallon its whole life. Um, and, and start, start with that right from the beginning, start with that expectation and then keep that in mind. So then if you know, if you're going to get a boa constrictor or a doom rose boa or a rainbow boa or um, uh, indigo snake or a reticulated python uh, that you know what you're getting into. And then uh Go ahead. The, the, I didn't mention the height when you said about the it, it's that high and stuff. Um, well, yeah, I wanted, let me stop you real quick because um, then I, I wanted to just uh, bring up what Lori brought up in the chat because um, I think it's really valuable here too. So uh, small tight spaces are something uh, they prefer for safety and to feel secure when resting or sleeping. Um, however, when they are awake and active, many species utilize large open spaces and travel open distances. And I think that's what... Um, what you were talking about with the, with the corn steak study and with the vet, veterinary recommendation. Um, and there's a level of activity that, that we experience um, that they don't, even though, yes, they, they do look for tight places to hide, um, they travel distances. I'm, I'm going through that right now. Uh, a few people know that uh, I had a snake escape on uh, Tuesday of this week. So uh, I guess that was a week ago today. Uh, and you know, if she stayed in a small, tight space, that would be terrific because then she wouldn't have left her cage or she'd be in the 
um, yeah, the nook right underneath it uh, the, on the table. Um, but she's not, she could be anywhere in the house at this point uh, because that's what they do. They, they go in a tight place to hide, but then when they're ready to come out, they come out and they travel a distance. Uh, so um, she'll turn up, but it's, it is one of those things that uh, I think very commonly we, we overlook and we, and we say, oh, see how, how it likes to hide? I don't need uh, more than this much space for a 12 inch snake. Um, because that's that's where they curl up in and they they're flexible like that, but they like to move out. Um, yeah, so Lori, it's it seems that people have taken just one aspect of snake behavior and formed housing around that instead of looking at their behavior twenty four seven. Absolutely, it's weird, okay. isn't it? Yeah, well, it's um, it, it is weird, but I also think it's convenient. Um, like I said, the, these cages fit perfectly in this room. Um, I could fit two more right next to it if I wanted to. And isn't four snakes better than just two? <laughs> so yes, but when you have that mindset, you think, okay, I keep smaller species. Mm -hmm. That's a it's, great point. You, you can be selective. Let's say, well, personally, I think one of the best snakes for pet owners is king snakes because the size they stay at. They're, re they're a relatively small snake. And and there's, there's a multitude of different subspecies and colors. So if you're into different colors and stuff it's not like like a corn snake where one could say three foot one could get five and a half foot like it's kings generally unless you get like one of the larger species or subspecies generally are quite are quite small and they aren't as active as a rat snake but that doesn't mean they're not active at all i agree i think they're a terrific beginner snake and and um even though a lot of people We'll tell you that I still think they're they're overlooked, um, just for how cool they are. Um, but yeah, you, we were saying about enclosure size. So what's like what's the value of of height as well? Because a lot of people they're like a lot of times that's not even mentioned in the in a carriage. Mm. It's sometimes they'll say give a, a stick to climb on. So what's really interesting is that they did a study in uh, gray gray rat snakes or the black rat snakes, one of them, um, where they had a separated clutch into a, a, a control and a test group. Now, the control group, they gave like the newspaper a water bowl and hide. Now, the test group, they gave hide water bowl, like shavings, and then a like this bit of like driftwood that was kind of like a stick upwards, like a notch at top, and it goes like that, and it was like angled back. So they basically gave a little bit of shavings and a stick essentially and the result of that study was that the test group with the enriched enclosure i say enriched because that it, to me that's minimal but compared to the newspaper and a water bottle yeah um they grew larger um grew longer and were weighed more in the same amount of time even though they literally weighed the pinkies and the food going in was exactly the same Temperature, everything was the same, like controlled for. Weighed more, they were better at adapting to new environments. Um, and that's something that Laurie talks about a lot. If you've got this understimulated snake and it can't adapt to new situations, then of course things are going to stress it out. It's about exposing them to new stresses and help letting them habituate and adapt and then grow cognitively. But yeah, they were better at adapting to new environments. They were better at like, this puzzle trial. Um, the ones in the complex environment were faster at it. They were better at subduing and killing live prey. Like just, just a little bit of complexity, like played a massive role in their cognitive development. And that's only providing like, a little bit of ability to climb and, or it basically is, they were allowed to express more species typical behaviors. And now when you take that into say, that thing behind me that's more complex than the little stick and a little bit of shavings so I, I i don't see how anyone can make the argument oh it, it, it isn't better for them cognitively and all the other choices thermoregulatory issues and things like that outside like even if it's just cognition i don't see any way you can make an argument where that is not better than before or how we may have done mm. it before progression you can't some people are stuck in the past and they want to fight against change humans by nature like can't stand change really so there's some there's some keepers that are like 
would always fight against it until the day they die. But when when it, when you see it in your own snake, anecdotally, like thousands of keepers are saying it as well, and then studies come out proving it, you you, you can't really argue this anymore. But we've uh, had a whole entire thought train that was going to go down. That just kind of like sidetracked myself. Um, with with the height and the regulations, the the AH, AAL has had no height regulations so it was just about the length and the width and then even this study about um they would use the large space they didn't mention height either so height is one of them things that if you give them height they will use it um and it will make a difference to the development of the animal the especially the muscle tone of the animal uh, there's a whole thing about like egg binding what some people think about that Mm -hmm. this everything just splits into so many things that think oh that could be that and that when you start talking about doing things a bit more advanced and just maybe just a little newspaper and a water bowl but yeah i mean even a terrestrial snake right i've got these king snakes they, they are terrestrial yeah um but two feet of height does not make them arboreal if right. anything, that two feet is well within the realms of terrestrial. You get terrestrial king snakes that people shine on cuts over where you are, and the, these are like what f- ten foot high. So then, it's it's not outrageous to provide a terrestrial animal with climbing opportunities. You think a log they they clamber over to get to the other side? That's going to be a lot higher than a fallen right. tree's brand, like circumference of the thing is taller than two feet. So it's just a fallacy with people arguing against like providing height to actually exercise when like that's still well within the realms of like terrestrial animals. <laughs> right. Absolutely. I think um, a, a lot of people fail to realize that even snakes like ball pythons climb trees, um, particularly when they're younger and smaller, but they've even found adult uh, ball pythons with uh, birds in their mm-hmm. stomach contents. Um, and the, the idea that, uh, Exactly, like you said, that a two-foot enclosure is anywhere near arboreal. Uh, I mean, Not even semi-arboreal, just terrestrial, but having yeah. exercise available. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's just like you said, in the wild, they go over a log. Um, they could go up, uh, up the road cuts and, and climb rocks. Um, uh, I keep a, a rosy boa, and, and they live in, in granite crevices, <clears throat> some in, in valleys, but a lot of them in the hills. And they'll climb up big rock faces um, because that's just how they're designed to, to climb. You wouldn't call them arboreal, uh, but uh, because they don't wrap around a tree and coil across it like a, um, like a python might um, or, you know, a tree boa, but they can wedge between rock cracks and almost go straight up a wall 10, 15, 20, 30 feet uh, without even blinking. So to add two feet of height to an enclosure for a terrestrial snake is, is only going to allow you to put that, that extra enrichment inside of it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just because they aren't classified by us as arboreal does not mean climbing is not part of the species typical behavior. No, well put. Um, and I, I, I saw that in your uh, your video when you visited the National Zoo too, and you saw the boa constrictors. And I think, was there a three or four in that enclosure? Uh, three, I think. And, and one was on the ground and two were up like seven feet in the trees. Uh, um, not one was on the ground. <laughs> no, <laughs> One was on a stump, this okay. platform that was like waist high and the others were like higher up, but like right. not one of them was on the ground. Yeah. Which is and, funny, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so it's like, that's what we can provide um, is that waist high. But if someone were to give them, um, you know, the eight foot, you'd see that uh, a lot of these real big, heavy snakes can like to get up high. Um, yeah, I mean, I would have really no cool doubt that I would find like a king snake, like in that same enclosure, mm-hmm. up in that same spot, if you gave them like a log to go up to get up to it or something. But yeah. you'd be surprised if you look at all of this and stuff. I used to have this, um, this clipboard um, with these like pegs on stuff, but I would let I've actually got videos on this, so yeah, go watch that. Um, I would open up the glass, slide it open. The snake would pop his head up here, would go all along this, and then just climb vertically up this vertical space hmm. on these little bits of clip that were well, that wide and just just grips it, just goes straight up. Now that is apparently someone that can't climb to a, a lot of keepers, but. Uh, 
this nonsense. Yeah, so um, so so far for, for length of the, uh, the cage, we're talking about at least the length of your snake mm -hmm. with some height. So one, two, three feet of, of height. Um, yeah. For, for you to, to build things within it to, to control it. It depends uh, on the species as well. You got cater, you got, people need to stop thinking about, I bought this enclosure, what can I put in this? Mm -hmm. Start thinking about how can I get an enclosure or buy an enclosure or create an enclosure or build an enclosure that meets this species needs or behaviors. So this a two foot high might be fine for, for a king snake, this small snake where getting itself off the ground and climbing um, and activating all these muscles can happen within two foot space. But if you've got something, say, like a, a royal python, who, who, whose natural history is actually semi-boreality and nest raiding and hunting of boreal mammals and birds, then you, I don't necessarily think we, we can go to extremes and say, OK, they hunt birds and then they need like a 10 foot high enclosure. I don't know if they need a 10 foot high enclosure, but I would say they definitely need to be able to express climbing. It's climbing that I think needs to be expressed, not necessarily the height they climb at. Mm. So I would say, can it climb properly and the ex ex same behaviours and muscle activation in a two foot? Probably not. I would probably say something, if it's like a four foot royal, I'd probably say like a four by two by four. Mm. would be more, more appropriate because that four foot space i would probably say is enough to get them to be able to actually lift themselves and activate these muscles and wrap something to that what's it what's it called a cotton cotton constantina locomotion where they like mm -hmm. do that shimming up thing they do that i mean laurie has perfect footage of that happening so yeah but i i think you have to just just think about what size of space or needed to allow that animal to actually express that. I mean, retics climb trees in the wild. Like, you, you, there's footage of adult retics literally just in the trees. Um, oh, yeah, to, 20 feet in, in the air. Yeah. So to, to say that, oh, yeah, two foot's enough to actually, <laughs> them to actually activate any part of the body to climb is obviously not enough. So you have to think about things as this species in particular is this enough for it to actually activate its body, <laughs> really, <Yeah. laughs> to climb? I mean, Laurie kind of has got the cheat sheet with all of that, with letting everything free roam and all the activity stations, stuff like that, really. But um, that that's, that is the pinnacle, really, of choice and control in all of it. So, Yeah, I would also, you know, plug uh, Laurie Torini's YouTube channel under that name and reptile education oh i pluck uh, her constantly yeah it, it's uh we're trying to sum up um i don't know how many hours she has of it uh 600 <laughs> with it within our conversation so we're, we're never gonna to touch on all of it so it's it's you know we're glad to have her on and um to be able to have that as a resource too it's, it's a lot of good information yeah um, when i start including behavior and things like that I, I know i know my stuff i can tell you what you need to know but i'm just like just go to glory because that, that is just, <laughs> yeah. that's just going i could take you to the entrance of the rabbit hole and i can just yeah. push you down it go find laurie <laughs> uh let's move uh move towards heating so a popular care sheet reads there are several types of snake heat lamps that help a uh, help heat a snake enclosure under cage heating pads and tapes like the zilla heat pad ceramic heat emitters basking bulbs both regular daytime and red night bulbs are just a few. With heat emitters and basking bulbs, it is crucial to keep an eye on the humidity within the enclosure, especially if combined with the screen top, as both will dry the air quickly. Use thermostats, rheostats, and or reptile timers to control your heat source. Do not use hot rocks with snakes as they can heat unevenly over too small of a surface area and can cause serious burns. So what's missing here? I think the way they framed that, I can't really say it's miss it kind of it kind of makes it sound like it's either or um when i think it's probably both i think with heat bulb is well heat bulb is the only way for you to provide near infrared and that is the shorter energy wavelengths of um the ones that are heat anyway near uh infrared um so you have to have a heat bulb to have that now some will say 
maybe you don't need to have that for a snake because they are most species are thigmothermic. But again, like what terrestrial does, uh, climbing. What does thigmothermic mean? Sorry, thigmothermic means they can gain heat from their surroundings by touching something conducting heat. Okay. So like when you see like a snake basking on the road after dark or something. Right. Belly heat. So belly heat. Yeah, I just just said belly heat. Um, <laughs> so yeah, people might, people might say all oh, all they need is belly heat. And to be fair, that might be true for some for some species if it's enough to get them by. But we're talking about taking things past this point of the spectrum and into the positive welfare and right. choice. So these stigmothermic species, yes, they do use stigmothermy a lot, but they will engage in heliothermy when they want to. And heliothermy, uh, he, uh, helio is like the sun, so it's just like sun worshipping, basking yeah. under sunlight, essentially. So the way to do it, I think, is not, oh, this is the best way. No, this is the best way. I think the best way is both. And I think the best way to provide that is either have your heat bulb projecting down onto a hide. I like the flat resin hides and then put a slab slate on top of that. Now that slab will get heated up from the radiation from the bulb. So there's the choice of the snake to go sit on top of that, bask under the, under, under the sun. And then if they want to, they can go under that hide. But that hide has been warmed by the hot rock that's conducting heat to the hive beneath it. So by doing that, you basically have both digmothermy and heliothermy together. Now you can take that one step further and have like eight, two different appliances if you want to, like a heat mat and then a basking bulb um, to get the exact temperatures you want. But um, say they want X amount of temperature, say they want like 30, what's American again? 30 is probably like close to 80, uh, 88. So let's say you want 88 Fahrenheit um, with the, uh, the basking and then the, the, the rock heating the hide. You might not necessarily get exactly 88 beneath, but if you're worried about them having that, you can do like separate appliances and make sure both options are 88. Then it's just 88 in radiation and light or 88 in darkness and sigma thermy. So I think the option of choice is Choices is the answer to every mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. and, and you'll find, like you said, uh, your Mexican black king snake um, will stick a coil out. Um, mm -hmm. and so so I, I see that too with my rainbow boas. Um, they'll be in the warm hide where they're just getting that uh, uh, sort of that ambient heat from the, the hide itself. And But they'll actually have a, a loop or a coil out and um, that'll be directly under their their heat projector getting the the you know a, a different form of infrared heat so um just because you'll see it with a leopard gecko they'll stick you know just like a handout of a cave um just because they're not doing like a bearded dragon where they stand up directly underneath the bulb and you know are like looking up at it and just basking in the heat doesn't mean that they're not basking and they're not benefiting from those those bulbs right exactly and sometimes they do I've got so much footage of my right. California or pictures of my California kings like literally just curled up under that basking bulb, just absorbing it all. And weirdly, they bask under UV like a lot when they're in blue. And I don't know why. Hmm. And I've not found any research on this to explain that. But every single time my snakes are in blue, they just sit out under the UV. And I don't know whether that's because they're cluttered, so they're not necessarily worried about security when they want to access this resource, or because most people say they never see the snake when they're in blue because they're in a hide. But mine, they bask under UV, but they're not, because I don't necessarily have them exactly lined up under the heat. So it's not heat they're going for. Right. They're literally sat under the UV and I don't know why. You know, I, I, I had a, a similar conversation with a few folks recently too, because I, I um, for the longest time and, and a number of my snakes, I know when they're going into shed because I don't see them, they disappear. Um, but uh, just a, a recent addition, a, a super dwarf python, um, would hide right under the basking bulb is, is very interesting under the under the uv um and then he sh or he shut out so uh, i i don't know why um but they... uh, i wonder if like elevated levels of like 25 hydroxy vitamin d like helps with the shedding process or the fluid build up or something but i, I have no idea I'm just saying big words. <laughs> I'd be I'd be guessing it best. Um, but let's so let's check that too. So uh, I think yeah, a lot a lot can be said about heating there, and it's it's not one or the other. It's 
it's both. It's all of it. Make sure you're providing all that heat because, like you said, choice is is ideal. Um, so after that, the lighting, the care guides are usually going to discuss lighting. Um, one thing I've read: supplemental lighting is not necessary for snakes, but if you used, it should run on a 12-12 cycle, meaning 12 hours on, 12 hours off. Continuous bright overhead lighting is stressful to snakes, especially a nocturnal species. So what are your thoughts on that? Is, is supplemental lighting necessary or not necessary? Uh, well, to be fair, the majority of that I would not disagree with apart from... Uh, no, I, I wouldn't disagree with that, really. I mean, it depends on how you... T again, necessary, subjective. Um, if it, is it necessary for the animal to like stay alive and its heart to keep pumping? No. But is it probably necessary to start getting into this area of positive welfare indicators? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, I, I watch this channel on YouTube. Um, I won't name. Um, it's Herping Across North America. And I asked him, I said, how often are you finding these snakes actually basking? Because um, I asked for footage to use in videos at one point. Um, explained I was going to make a video about thickenthermy and heliothermy and stuff. And he goes, oh, snakes don't bask. And I was like, right. And he was like, I only find snakes basking in the morning when, when, when they're shedding, when, they, when they're ill, just out of brumation or when they've got parasites or something like that. And I was like, so, so, so they bask. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? They just said they bask. Yeah. <laughs> they only bask when they want to warm up. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> So yeah, um, that was a strange one, but um, I think if if it's something that obviously in nature as well, we don't have a heat bulb and a UV. Everything is in within the same wavelengths, so that everything has a, a use for and a protection against each resource. So you know, like bearded dragons have really thick um, scales because they bask under really high UV eyes. So. They need protection against something that they're using. But a leopard gecko, they bask under really low UVIs because they're crepuscular, or, or actually they're cathermic now. But, um, but they have a thinner skin so that it's easier to make more use of something that's a lower value. So everything has a protection for UV in the wild. So why do people not think that they that they wouldn't use it? I mean, I had a trail that I was going down and I completely lost it halfway. So that might have been a bit confusing. But <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, things like Mexican black king snakes. If you look at old old textbooks, um, that apparently the way that they uh, thermoregulate changes with the seasons. So. In summer, they become more nocturnal, but in, mm. in closer to the winter time, they become more diurnal because that black um, pigmentation of the phenotype allows them to absorb more radiation and extract more from it. So there's so many species that have different patinations and different amounts of melanin in their, their scales and stuff. They have a protection against UV. So what makes people think that they don't use it? I mean, even if you knew nothing about what biologically goes on to a snake under UV, let's take a really objective um, stance on it and say, right, we've provided this bulb. The snake appears to seek UV. Therefore, this resource should be provided to allow this animal to act on the behaviors it's motivated to perform. So even if you didn't understand why they're using the UV, the fact that they're choosing and seeking to use it means that you should provide it. If you're trying to get into like this positive welfare, I mean, if you're fine with like being bog standard and not caring about welfare anyway, then I don't think any conversation anyone's gonna have with you is gonna change your mind. But if you're no. actually trying to advance keeping to a next level, then this is where we're going to start going. And, and that's what I got from, from reading the article that you shared as well, um, was that there, and from the conversation you had with the herper, um, and there's a level of 
seeing something and not just seeing it and saying, oh, okay, but also learning from it and applying it. Uh, so when we see that a snake goes over logs or over rocks in the wild, we don't just say, oh, interesting. Well, they're only doing that because those are there. Uh, and then put our snake back in the tub that slides in a drawer and keep it in the dark with no, you know, nothing but a water bowl. Um, we say, oh, I see that they do that. So I'm going to try and replicate that in my enclosure. So, oh, I see that they are processing UV. They have um, the metabolic and the physiological traits necessary to handle UV radiation and the, the near infrared heat. So instead of just ignoring that, I'm going to provide that. Uh, and, and that's where it comes from. Like you said, there's a science of it. It's measurable. There's aspects that we see and if we either replicate them in the hobby or choose not to, right? Um, so that that's, you can measure if you're hitting those marks or not. And that's one of the toughest things about keeping North American snakes, in my opinion, is, uh, and, and anywhere else that's really temperate as opposed to the, the tropical zones, which are pretty consistent year round, is, is they have very different behavior. So I, I, you have to, if you really wanna try and do it, you, Maybe you should consider changing the amount of light they get in the year at certain times, the amount of heat they get at certain times, and, and kind of have it be a, an arc, mm. much like how we have spring to summer. Seasonal cycling, yeah. Yeah, and that's not easy. <laughs> uh, so it, it can get pretty complex. Um, there's, uh, and that's, that's, you know, it's all part of that spectrum of, of getting past the midpoint. Uh, just going back to talking about measurable and UV, I just want to say one thing on yeah. UV and then move on. First of all, obviously, you talk about choice. You provide it over one area, light and then dark. Like if, you, if you're still skeptical, try it. it you, over one area, the, like you're not going to like do any damage to your snake because it has access to get away from it. So mm -hmm. you'll see what happens. I would, I would say is make sure you're using it properly. I was listening to one podcast recently where the gentleman said, um, I tried UV, they, they, they uh, wouldn't use it. Now, this is a species that I know and I've seen people using and they're just basking under it. So if you don't know how to use the tool properly, then you might actually provide a really high UVI without knowing. So you're actually, uh, too much of anything is aversive, of course. So if you're providing too much UV, um, of course, it's going to be aversive. That's like saying, have I kept a snake in enclosure where the entire thing was the heat map? Like suddenly heat that was the resource they were seeking is suddenly aversive because they can't get away from it. That's right. They can't. So it's all about make sure you're providing it properly. And if, if I'd set that enclosure up and I knew exactly what the levels were and then still saw um, that snake being aversive, I'd be very, very shocked. Um, the one thing I'll just leave us in UV and we'll say this, that two studies that have been done on the levels of vitamin D in the blood serum of snakes before and after being given UV. Now, people say snakes get enough U uh, vitamin D from their diet, right? So they're, so in theory, you would say they're, in, like, they're obviously near optimal levels from their diet, right? Because they get, they get enough. So with vitamin D, uh, with, vitamin D, with UV, the way that it works is they have a, a shutoff point when they've produced enough vitamin D. So they shut off all production and all these things get converted into like inert things and stuff. So they have a whole cycle. They have a fail safe. They can't overdose. So in theory, then, the, the levels of vitamin D in the blood serum should only go up a little bit. You'd argue, oh, my voice is going in, I can feel it. <clears throat> you'd argue that if they're already at near optimal levels from prey you might see like a little top up from the uv if they're already at near optimal levels the increase in these snakes in corn snakes and burmese pythons guess the percentage increase uh, i don't want to i want you to tell me corn snakes was like 360 <laughs> percent. yeah that's a lot so that's not a little top up that's like the whole barrel being filled up <laughs> over and then Burmese python was like 600%. So you cannot tell me that their vitamin D levels were like near optimum when they, it was just rodents. And um, people people just don't realize that. Well, that, that um, I mean, I think that goes back to that point, right? Where, where we're in the middle of that 
that zone. Yes, they have a survivable amount of D3 from uh, getting the, the brains and the livers and the kidneys of, of rodents because they eat the whole prey um, and the bones and the marrow and stuff. But there's so much more they can do. And we all know uh, there's plenty of, of information about the value of D3 in, in a lot of animals. Um, I, I had recently read too that uh, kind of to throw on a, a, a bit of a tangent um, that during the uh, apocalyptic event that wiped out the dinosaurs, right? The, the meteorite that crashed and smoke and ash and dust um, clouded, clouded and blotted out the sun for, for many years. That was when snakes really evolved as a class of animals. Um, and, and it was because they were able to thrive with very little food and very little light um, and thrive in relative terms compared to the mammals and the plant eaters and those sort of things that, that did die off. So um, snakes really benefited from that. Now, I don't think anyone is designing a vivarium to replicate that era in history of, of apocalyptic standards, you know? So when we say that they don't need, that they've evolved, it's like, yeah, they evolved to survive through the toughest uh, event that we've seen in the last uh, uh, 70 million years, um, you know, just wait a few years, but we'll, we'll see if we can top it. But uh, it, it's, it is one of the biggest extinction events in the history of the planet and snakes were able to survive it. But that doesn't mean that that's the level that we should take it back down to and say like, well, they can get by here. So mm. that's good enough. Uh, that was kind of a ramble, but uh, I think I maybe landed that ship at the end. No, I mean, uh, a lot of people say like, oh, if we're going to provide everything natural, then these extremists, why don't, why don't we say we provide predators or provide parasites right. because this is natural, but we're taking things from the wild that are beneficial and are positively impacting the animal into captivity and negating everything negative. So it's not just about anything that's natural. It's about everything that that animal has access to in the wild that they benefit from but taking away things that negatively impact them. Mm -hmm. So this like euphoric captivity situation, essentially, or trying to be. I think that's great. I don't understand why that's a hard concept. So. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, let's ask, so uh, another thing um, that the guy talks about feeding, um, and this we don't think we need to spend too much time on because I think they get a good amount. Uh, but the guide says to feed a prey item the size of the circumference of the snake once a week um, and every one to two weeks for adults. I suggest mice or rats as the prey items and not to be concerned if your snake doesn't eat or shed during the drier, cooler months of the year. Um, what are your thoughts on, on basic feeding? I mean, yeah, I would, I would, I would say, yeah. Um, yeah. Thing is, people need to realize, say something like this, like, okay, use that. Get to grips with um you know keeping things along keeping this pet and then go past it's take pieces and pieces from different things here and there use that and then go okay what's next how can i get better at this i mean again it's subjective different species require different amount of food like uh, like a raw python probably an adult should be probably eating like once every six months give or take uh, like a decent size meal mm. uh, and then like a coach whip will probably eat like three to five days because their metabolism is just mental so it, it isn't necessarily some general rule. there is kind of some general rules that can fit most species but again you need to go past that and really start understanding the natural history of the species you're choosing to keep um get really into it and specialized in that care yeah i think uh, it's uh... To generalize for that, it's so different based on the species you're keeping. Mm. Um, a, a growing king snake, snake is going to be a lot different than an adult boa. Um, so, uh, more and again, I think weighing of snakes. Oh, sorry. What was go that? ahead. No, yeah, go I ahead. I think weighing weighing of snakes is good. I mean, uh, most people don't have to weigh the snakes; they can look at body condition and get by. But if you weigh your snakes and your snake goes off like feeding for a couple of times or something, and, you, and you're weighing your snake weekly or periodically and you notice it's not losing weight then that, then there's no reason to like freak out over it because it's not losing weight i think that's a great point yeah that's something that uh and, and you still see a lot you see very veteran keepers say well i never wear a snake and that's fine um maybe you don't have to maybe you can look at it and know 
Um, but for someone just getting into it, especially as trying to learn and, and learn right there along with the snake, weigh your snakes. It's really easy. Get a food scale, a little bin, pop your snake in it um, <laughs> and track it and, and keep it, whether it's an app, whether it's a notebook. Yeah. Um, just I mean, it's it. no disrespect to like the veteran keepers, but I would probably, I used to think the same to go over body condition, but how many grams lost of weight does it take for body condition to be noticeable? Mm -hmm. Like, can, can you visually identify like 20 grams of weight loss suddenly? Like yeah. that's one way to suddenly realize, oh shit, something's going on here. It's time to go to the vet. We start realizing like this is dropping weight quickly. But you want to, you don't want to get things on the trailer. You want to get things preemptively before things get serious. So just going by, I personally, I wouldn't be able to look at my snake and know I just dropped five grams today. Like, no. I know five grams isn't a lot, but if your snake is starting to go into something like a disease or something you didn't know it had, and it's dropping like serious amount of weight, you might not even notice that visually in terms of body condition until quite far along. So I, I would say weigh your snake. That's even a good yeah yeah that's it i think that's really good advice um that people don't you know check on the medical history of your snake too um mm -hmm. don't just assume because they they're relatively easy to keep compared to to a dog or a cat um and um e even other reptiles like lizards and things that that are uh, more active feeders and stuff snakes in my opinion are, are relatively easy to keep they're, they're they could be very low maintenance um, especially like you said, if you're feeding a ball python every several months, six months, twice a year, four times a year, um, th there's not much there. But also, you should anticipate some medical attention. Um, that things happen, injuries happen, um, illnesses happen, even just biological functions. You know, a female could have a problem with it, with uh, ovulation, even even if she's never been introduced to a male um, and, uh, and egg binding and those sort of things. So there's always concerns that you should look out for. And weighing your snake is, is a very affordable, you know, thing you could do at home without any expertise whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, what about substrate? So, so one of the things that I always see recommended is paper or newspaper or paper towels. Uh, but, but is there an argument to be made for substrate? Yes, I would say so. It depends. Again, it depends on the species. If you've got something that truly never visits the ground, then then maybe you you could like not use some sort of substrate. But if if you're something that you know one one of its typical behaviors is digging, then loose substrate is the only way to to really achieve that properly. I'm not saying you have to buy like some ridiculously hundred hundred dollar substrate from some well-known bioactive brand i mean the shavings could actually just allow digging as long as you've got a humid hide and you're catering from the lack of human microclimate in the soil with an actual humid hide then that's what that's what that is that one that everyone thinks looks amazing someone mm -hmm. someone argued with me in a, in a kingsley group saying yeah but we don't have to keep bioactive it's not bioactive it's shavings so how that complexity and trying to increase natural behaviors isn't necessarily like conflated with bioactivity. Like shavings is a good substrate, but well, depending on the savings, but yeah. Yeah. So I think that that's great. It just goes back to um, what you'd mentioned earlier about uh, one habitat complexity, uh, but two having that choice to replicate natural behaviors. So if, if, if your snake likes to, to dig under leaf litter, um, or under a few inches of soil or down into burrows, then it would make sense that a paper towel substrate just, or newspaper substrate is, is not going to be able to provide for that. Uh, it's just, it's not the same. That's something that I've never really understood with like this whole rackham stackham raw python thing. They say, oh, they're, they're for soil, they dig and they like use burrows and stuff, but then don't cater to that natural, that natural behavior. And they say they're trying to replicate a burrow well, aren't burrows in the wild like really high humidity and you're keeping it like a low humidity in a rack? Especially if it's like a king snake, they argue it's fossorial, then keep it low humidity in a burrow replication. You're not replicating a burrow. Yeah, it's um, it, it's exactly like, uh, like what Laura mentioned in the chat earlier, that they take one aspect of the snake behavior um, hmm. and, and form the housing around that. You know, it's and it's... It, it all boils, it boils down to, I think, what's easiest for us sometimes. Um, and 
Yeah, I think so. And I get that. Uh, but it's uh, when we know better, we should try and do better. Yeah, I mean, if people are going to do what's best for them, ignore what's best for them, fair enough. Do it. Like, do it behind closed doors if you're going to be like weird like that. But it's when people like try to argue what's best for the animal like as, as a hobby can we not just recognize what's best for the animal period and then you can act on that based on how ethical you really are as, a, as an individual <laughs> but well, trying to like arguing over what is actually best for the animal it's not saving the hobby is anything it's putting the hobby under danger and so I wanted to talk about that. So yeah, like if, if people could be honest about where they are on that welfare spectrum, um, say, hey, look, I provide the care that is necessary to keep my snake alive and I'm completely content with that. That's, at least there's honesty there. Um, you know, then it's it's more of a subjective thing as to, um, you know, where they fall on that spectrum and, and how people want to feel about that. But if, uh, if they, they are at that midpoint and say, well, this works, therefore it's best, that's when I think it becomes argumentative. That's uh, why it annoys me. And and yeah, it, it 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 annoys a lot of people. And then it it creates that tension, right? Where then if someone's on one side of the spectrum and someone's at the other, and they're both arguing that that's the best, well, there's going to be conflict. Um, and there's these folks aren't going to be swayed to to bring their care down. And these folks, because of that conflict, are not going to be persuaded to uh, to bring their to advance their care they're going to dig in where where they are and and you know want to win the argument so it's it's all stuff that i think we can if we're just honest about where we're at um that's the only way we could actually progress without it being a conflict and, that, and that's you know for people on both sides they we have to know how to speak to one another <laughs> yeah um, i think both sides can learn like i had this conversation with francis Squirry, um and he said to me he basically said look, both sides can learn from each other i mean one side might not, like be really into like animal welfare and know about all this positive welfare stuff and things like that, and then like the maybe the minimalist keeper might be excellent at you know you know like popping snakes or sure. some other experience based things like that where you can't really get any of that from natural behavior and things like that it's just that is experience so you you can learn from each other and you don't have necessarily have to be closed off to each other completely you just have to take things that are worth it to you like if the breeder says oh let's say you do this popping wise and show you perfect learn from them if they say a rich mint is just a word to make you feel better ignore that because that's mm. stupid and not science-based but i th i think that if you get this middle ground where you say, okay, we can learn from each other, but the thing that one side is like, obviously science, science, science. And one, some of the arguments I've had says like, oh, science is subjective is whoever wants to write paper makes it what they want it to be about. I'm just like, you're lost mate. So there's no point out there. <laughs> there's no getting through to you. So there's one thing, there's, not everyone's obviously science denying, but it's almost like trying to drag someone up with you essentially mm. um and the 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 realization i've had recently is that um i'm trying to convince the wrong or trying not trying to educate and highlight what's there to the wrong people i mean for example the papers on royal pythons came out in like 90 93 90 in the 90s anyway they're not the was like three decades ago and people are still saying oh they don't climb stuff and it's like this was long before you even got into the hobby this period of you keeping you've never once actually taken aboard science so i i don't think anyone's gonna really convince them i think it's about focusing on new people into the hobby and taking them in the right right direction before they get lost in this world of folklore husbandry and all that stuff yeah i think you're right i think starting at the beginning um mm. is, is the way to go and and maybe in 25 years we'll see that there's been an impact in the way that people keep snakes and if guys like me will be years. saying like i can't uh well i can't uh, you know I'll, I'll be the one arguing and saying oh, i've done it i've kept them with uvb for <laughs> you know this way for the last 20 years and they've been great um and you know maybe it'll be even advanced past that so uh, 
it'd be interesting to see what uh, I know you wanted to talk a bit about um, sort of what I don't want to say our enemies, but people who don't want snakes to be kept in captivity. Um, they talk about welfare a lot and the welfare of animals. So why are we talking about the same thing? Um, and is that a bad thing? Well, no matter what your own personal beliefs, animal welfare is a science and the science is independent of whatever way you want to use it. Now, we can use it to be like, this is, this is amazing. We can use it to progress our care, take things to the next level. But then a certain subset of extremists, animal rights activists, anti, whatever you want to call them, will take this, um, see, oh, these, these snakes need an enclosure, the length of their body and whatnot. Or they can see what science is there and say, this hobby is not doing this and this is why it should be banned. Whereas what the hobby should be doing is going, oh shit, they pointed out something very, very, very obvious. We need to like plug the holes in our boat sort of thing and get our standards up to scratch. Because you take that to government and point out that very, very scientific argument, you, 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 you can't argue it. You can't defend yourself against something that is science apart from just science denying. So the hobby needs to just fix itself <laughs> bring it stands up to scratch so there is nothing to mm. actually attack then it becomes oh i don't like it well well tough luck like we're we're keeping at a good welfare standard uh this 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 and this just because you don't like it doesn't mean doesn't mean diddly squat but at the moment they can say they're failing on welfare grounds this 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 and this so yeah the hobby's losing I think that's a great point. If there's a, a hypothetical, you know, congressional hearing where one side brings the science of welfare and they have documents and they have research and they have examples and then they have examples where the hobby is not meeting that. And the other side comes in defendant and says, look, I've been doing this my this way my whole life. Well, the, the, the lay person, the, the, the congressperson that's, you know, determining uh, whether or not they're gonna enact new laws is gonna say, well, I don't know. So I'm going to go with what the science tells me, you know, in this hypothetical world, maybe not in the U.S. Congress. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the to uh, fair, it's like it in the U.K. now. Yeah, <laughs> um, it, it, I, I imagine most people deal with with uh, that sort of, uh, you know, politics yeah. are fun. Uh, but but hypothetically speaking, right, the side with science wins and we'd be foolish to not incorporate that into our own keeping <clears throat> and consider that moving forward which is why i'm really glad you we we were able to have this conversation and talk so much about it today is there is there anything else you wanted to touch upon that, that you feel like we left out for you know your basic snake keeping oh i mean i could have gone on about that whole time and watching for ages <laughs> yeah we could do 20 more of these i think yeah to be fair i mean one thing i'll say even if you don't understand welfare science and the actual science they're using against against you if you're that person um what looks better to the public this and what the inside of that looks like or the little tub of vermiculite in a water bowl in a think, tub too small for a snake that you're showing all over facebook because you're proud of what color it is animal rights go, oh i'll take that picture please to use mm -hmm. my campaign they're not gonna use that are they no no, I, I think that's a that's a great point. And, and I see a lot of, it's funny because when a lot of people really jump in to snakes and, and they have sort of an emotional response, a lot of people are upset when they see, their first response is they're upset when they see snakes kept in, in small tubs in a, in a drawer. Um, you know, they don't know much about snakes, but they know that they're not socks. And so it's, it's weird to see snakes kept in a sock drawer. Um, you know, because that's that's the impression that it gives off. So, it, again, I don't want to to bash too much of that because I think there's a place for it, right? And and we know that um, there's been rack and and keeping debates, and there's plenty of benefits to to mass producing that helps actually keep things from being taken from the wild and so on and so forth, and uh, a number of different arguments that we could go on there. But that is people's first response, and and it's easily used uh, against us if if we're not promoting the alternative as well.
Well, it actually gets used a, a lot when they point out the ignorance and that the keepers don't know what they're doing when people say that this tub is the best. Even this, in the introduction of studies and the justification of why they're doing the study, it'll say like, well, popular horticulturists think this is better for snakes, but this has not been empirically proven. And this is the result because it gets exactly what they're thinking is correct. So they don't know what they're doing. And even if just like, I don't want to get into the whole economic argument because that's the whole thing but even if we as a hobby education we just understand even, even if you're like some massive producer of snakes who's keeping under these tight rack conditions because you've got a bottom line and all this stuff the minimum you could be doing is i keep this but keep it this way because this is what's best for the animal and then it becomes about what well how come you get to get away with it just because you're making money that's a different argument but mm. very least you could be doing as, as, as a hobby, we can recognize what's best for the animal. Then our image does not look so bad. Right. Like Laurie, uh, uh, Laurie added in the chat here, welfare science looks at animals given a starting premise and develops measurable outcomes to assess welfare. Uh, personal ethics don't come into it. For example, if I'm a welfare yeah. scientist hired to assess the welfare of chickens used for food, I have to look at how to maintain the best welfare for them under those circumstances, not whether it's ethical to eat them or not. Exactly. Um, exactly. And, and that, um, I think that falls into acknowledging where you are on, on that spectrum and what you're doing for, for the snakes. Yeah. I mean, when you have an argument based on welfare, whether this is good for the bad for the animal, based on welfare and this continuum, and someone tries to use this economic argument, oh, we wouldn't have this because of this, that isn't a welfare argument. Welfare is separate for your ethical reason for why you're not doing it or whatever. It's not, some people just can't stick to the welfare, I suppose. No, it's, it's good. Uh, I think it's, um, that's, it's a, a great point in terms of something that we shouldn't forget. Something I shouldn't forget because I was the one that brought that argument up. Uh, Liam, it, it's been great having you. Is there anything else you wanted to, to throw in before we uh, sign off? Um, I would say check out Laurie's channel Yep. for welfare check out mine <laughs> are you allowed to plug <laughs> yeah check out my channel reptiles and research um basically say everything i've said so far and more and i'm writing a book basically that welfare thing that you saw today that you're actually linking to i basically ripped that out of a section out of my book that i'm writing and what i'm doing with this book which i think is really cool is that it's going to be an ebook it's going to be short and it's going to be about basically just getting these understanding and these ideas across to keepers but to make sure that people actually get these ideas come across to them um i'm doing like a 50 percent uh affiliate commission so if you recommend my book to laurie and she buys it for like ten dollars i get five dollars you get five dollars and hopefully that makes it spread like wildfire through the hobby and these actual science and everything gets across to people but also it's a chance for people to actually make money from like from loving reptiles but do a good thing um sometimes sometimes making money requires welfare sacrifices but not this one you're actually propelling good welfare and making money so i say use uv you can use that money pushing this book to buy a uv or whatever <laughs> replacement bulbs <laughs> yeah i thought that was a good way to help everyone out no it's a it's an innovative idea and, and uh let's see if it catches on i i uh, i'm certainly interested to see it when it comes out yeah i just gotta write it first of all <laughs> gotta do it <laughs> that'll be the first step mm. all right thanks again i'm gonna turn off recording now